Hey folks, this is Cliff with Olsen C10 Shop. We have a engine for a blast to the pass truck and it is a 350 and we just got it back from the machine shop. Uh, the crankshaft's in it and we are going to be assembling this engine today and um, a lot of you have done this before but if you haven't this will give you uh, some point, pointers and, and, and tips to ensure that uh, you can do this without uh, making a mess out of your project. So uh, before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through what we're doing with this truck so you have an idea what the game plan is. And we'll make a series out of this so uh, you can all follow along with the Blast of the Past truck. Uh, thanks, and uh, here we go. All right, well, here's the truck. Um, it is a C30, not a C10, um, but it's the same principle. And we found a really good one to start with. Um, these are getting hard to find. And the one-ton uh, dualies uh, only came in two-wheel drive from 67 to 72. Well, actually, from 60 to uh, 60 to 72. Um, with the clearance light cabs, uh, those were mandated by the DOT. And so all the C30 cabs, if you ever go find, find them, they'll have the dimpled roof for the clearance lights. They were also an option on other trucks, so you can find them on other trucks as well, but all C30 should have them. So if you find a C30 that doesn't have them, on, a, on, on particularly the 6970, 7172s, then the cab was swapped or the skin was replaced. So that's kind of a, a heads up. And that's, that's a good general rule. So this body wasn't in terrible shape. We paid seven grand for the truck. And we're going to dump a bunch of money into it, but it'll be a one-of-a-kind truck that it was never made. And the truck that was never made was a C30 dual rear wheel, four-wheel drive truck. And this one started life as a, as a two-wheel drive, dual rear wheel uh, truck, uh, two-wheel drive that had um, a four-speed in it. So this is a little bit of a mess, but there's a four-speed. So we are going to be putting an automatic in it. We removed the disc brake front cross member that was available in 7172 with a sway bar. And we basically got a bare frame now. So we're gonna modify the frame uh, and install. I've already installed the front uh, shackle hangers for the front leaf springs. Those were taken from a donor truck and we have the rear shackles but unfortunately the two-wheel drive trucks had emergency brake cables that went through the frame and that's exactly where the shackle is so we've got to fix that which uh, i've got a plan uh, idea how i want to do that uh, without putting a big patch panel in the frame and making a mess out of that so i'm going to try doing something and if it works great and if it doesn't then well then we're going to put a patch panel in it so uh, stay tuned for more This is the transmission we're gonna to install to Turbo 400. Um, it has a four wheel drive case and a four wheel drive output shaft. So it's set up for a four wheel drive. You'll notice that the output shaft is recessed pretty far in and it's a 32 spline. If you were to count those splines on the output shaft, that's what you would see it would be 32, 32 spline output shaft. This is the transfer case. It's an MP205. It's a Turbo 400 style. It has a 32 spline female uh, input shaft with a figure eight style. And that figure eight style, as you can see, is um, that's an older style. There's a round style. Um, those are harder to find. And the, the Holy Grail or the Unicorn is the round style with the, with the really long input. Uh, that's the one everybody wants to convert 4L80Es to MP205. Well, why do you want MP205? Well, in these trucks, the front differential is on the passenger side. It's offset to the passenger side, which means that the output shaft on the transfer case has to be on the, uh, on the passenger side. And because it's on the passenger side, we don't have to modify or retrofit a different front axle on it. We can use... Uh, Dana 60 and that has a passenger side drop because it came from a Chevy uh, one-ton square body 
So the output shaft basically lines up with the input shaft. So if you were to look at it, it could go straight across. That's for your rear drive shaft. And it has a mechanical speedometer for the 72 style uh, truck. So this transfer case came out of a, a square body, a 74. And the front differential, which I'll show you in a minute, came out of a 74 uh, as well. So that's the MP205 that we're gonna put in the 72 blast to the past truck. So uh, we'll move on to the front differential. All right, so this is the Dana 60 front dually uh, front end, front differential. It's a dually because it has this long offset from the brake rotor for the dually offset wheels. Um, for this one, we put new rotors, calipers, U-joints, tie rod ends, a new steering stabilizer, and uh and we changed the oil and cleaned everything out lubricated everything really well so it looks good uh this should make a good front differential for our truck these are uh expensive and hard to find so just be prepared if you're going to go this route we bought this one a long time ago so we didn't pay a ton of money for it uh but uh still paid 1500 bucks and put another 500 into it so we're into, into this front for two thousand dollars now and that's kind of what you're going to be up against if you're looking for a good one. Um, this is a King Pandana 60, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from a 74 uh, K30 one-ton four-wheel drive pickup that was parted out. So that's going to be uh, one of the few trucks you're going to be able to find a passenger side drop for uh, that has the same perch, spring perch dimensions uh, as a three-quarter ton uh single wheel axle so it bolts up basically uh, we bought a rough stuff specialties uh u-bolt kit and we also got a, a rough stuff specialties crossover steering for it uh, which uses a two-wheel drive steering box so we don't have to change the steering box uh, just the pitman arm and then we got a rough stuff specialties differential cover and uh oh we got some visitors um because at our house it wouldn't be complete without some chickens. Uh, I'm going to show you some tips and tricks for uh, assembling the engine. Uh, we basically got it back from the machine shop. It's bored uh, 60 over. And it is a 350 four bolt main engine that originally came with this truck. It had been rebuilt once already in the past. Uh, we wanted to freshen it up. So uh, we had a little taper in the cylinder. So we went ahead and bored it. Um, and uh, we're gonna put it together now stay tuned all right so here are the piston and rod assemblies you'll notice um, they put ARP fasteners on them I bought this as a rotating assembly so this is a summit uh, eagle rotating assembly uh, about $700 comes with a crankshaft pistons rods they come assembled like this it comes with main bearings and rod bearings and rings, some assembly supplies. Um, so it's a pretty good deal in the context of, um, you know, by the time you, you were to take your crankshaft, have it turned uh, and fitted correctly by all the parts, and then you would not wind up with a balanced rotating assembly, which this is uh, balanced also. And they come fitted so you don't have the machine work to fit new pistons on and all that other stuff. So if you've got to bore your engine, this is a pretty good way to go. Um, they're nothing special. These are uh, Eagle uh, rods and they're uh, made out of good material. So they, they, uh, they will definitely be much stronger than what was originally there. And with the ARP fasteners, you can either use a stretch gauge, which measures how far the bolt stretches when you torque it which it comes with specifications for that when you uh, when you buy the rotating assembly, or you can set it to a torque setting and use uh, ARP. It's like a I don't know. It's like a never seize type material. It's um it's designed to give you an accurate torque reading, and it's made by ARP. And it I recommend it for uh, any assembly just for the simple fact that it will help you get an accurate torque measure so this is what it's called uh, it's called uh, fastener assembly lubricant and the brand the, or the trade name is ultra torque by arp 
and um, you put some under the head and some on the threads and uh, you'll get an accurate torque reading. So this is pretty good stuff. The rings come in packages and you know I bought um, fairly sedate rings because this is this is going to be a work truck uh, for Blast of the Past and it's our media blasting company um, and auto restoration company so um, we restore old trucks and and whatnot and we're just getting started so uh, like and subscribe to this channel uh, we would greatly appreciate it. It will help us get our business going. Uh, so this is the the rings in the, you'll see the package has a number one on it. That's the top ring. Um, so these go in the top top position. These are 564 rings. Uh, the ones that Summit originally sent were 1.5 millimeter for the first groove, 1.5 millimeter for the second groove, and 3 millimeter for the for the scraper oil oil ring, um, which was incorrect for these pistons, so they sent me the correct one and and made it right. So that that was just an honest mistake that uh, was easily resolved. Just took a little time, which is a bummer, but it is what it is. So there's our top ring. This is our second groove, as it says. Um, this is going to be a different different ring, and this ring is different because it has a taper on it. Um, it's going to be really hard to see here, but it's got a slight taper on it and that taper is um, Is going to go to the bottom of this of this ring landing so it, it'll be really hard to see but it actually says Right here uh, I'm not sure I can get there quite the right light on it, but it says top so this face is upward on the second uh, ring landing and you notice that the top uh, first ring landing on the top of the piston uh, these are not labeled top and bottom because there's no there's no chamfer on them they're, they're basically the same one way or the other it doesn't really matter the third ring is an oil scraper and it's got these uh, accordion style um, um, spacers that space out the oil scrapers they're, they're made out of stainless steel um, these are very simple uh, just a quick note when you're installing these you'll notice they have like this corrugated shape to them you want the the joint where the two ends meet to point upwards so when these are installed you're going to want this top joint where it it um, separates to point up something to know the scrapers you get 16 of them in the set uh, one goes above and one goes below that corrugated uh, expanding ring and um, these are just made out of stainless steel there's no top and bottom and they go on fairly easy so let me show you how we put them on and uh and how they're oriented because how they're oriented on the piston you know where the gaps are you know you want to ideally not put them uh, in the same position up and down on the piston so um as just a basic rule read your instructions on your assembly and it'll tell you how to do it but as a general rule, you're always going to want to stagger them. So let's get started. All right, so this is our first uh, our first victim. It's a uh, unnumbered, so they, they don't have a number on them. Uh, there are serial numbers on them, but there's no, and there's weights. Uh, they wrote the weights down, um, but that's really it. There's nothing exotic or fancy about these at all. They do have the the dot. Obviously, it points to the front of the engine, so you know that this rod is uh, going to orient the piston in a certain way, which then will make the face of the rod match the other face of the other rod, which then uh, doesn't create any conflict. So uh, all those things are important, and you always want to get them uh, oriented correctly. And again, these are, these are eagle rods, um, so uh, that's pretty much it. So we're going to start with the... With the expanding uh, spacer on the oil ring and you basically just set the the ring in the groove and roll it around that uh, gap of course in the in the ring which is now very hard to see is pointed up so <clears throat> we'll put uh, one of the oil rings on first I like to put the top one on first and it simply just goes on the same way that the other one did 
and you roll it around and it lands on the top as you can see i'm going to turn on some light and see if that helps a little bit there we go that's probably much better here's our gap for our oil ring and here's our gap for this expanding ring and we're going to orient these so that they stagger and then of course we're going to put our bottom in of course i grabbed two so be careful with that obviously and i'm going to put the bottom one on Again, kind of in the same methodology of the top. Just roll it around. Be careful not to bend it or, or mess it up. Now we're going to go and roll this around and check our, make sure that it's seated correctly. All right. And so there it is. And then I'm going to put the second ring on and the top ring on. And then I'll show you how I'm going to stagger them. So here's our second ring. Remember it says top on it because it's got a chamfer on it. And it's his top. We'll go ahead and put this one on. And again, be very careful because uh, these are made out of cast material. So they will be fragile and will break easily if you're not careful. And so if you have a ring spreader, of course, that would be better as it would reduce the risk of, of uh, damaging the ring. So there it is. You'll notice it's got a big gap. It's always a good idea to go ahead and put your uh, ring in the cylinder bore, which I did, and check the gap. And there's a, a, a tool that pushes this in exactly uh, even with the top of the deck of the engine. And then you can get a feeler gauge in between it and check it. Uh, we had 12 thousandths on our ring gap, which is what the specs recommended. So we're in good shape with that. The top ring gap is the most important because that uh, is going to heat up the most. And if it heats up too much and expands, it will actually crack the landing of the piston, this top landing. And then you'll have a catastrophic engine failure. So you definitely want to make sure that your ring gaps are in tolerance. Almost always they are. And I say that because I've rebuilt many engines and I've never had one that was... Um, that, you know, there was a disaster with it um, because the ring gaps are important on turbocharged engines or forced induction engines. That gap is going to be bigger because there's more heat, more pressure, more stress, and you don't want to break the top of the piston. <clears throat> so that's that. Um, I will go ahead and show you next how to sequence these rings so that they land in the, the gaps land in the right spot. All right. So here's the instructions on the rings, which they're kind of garbage. Poorly written, not very descriptive, uh, not really done in a way that, you know, is going to be easy to understand. So I'll just explain this, I'll cheat a little bit here and, and just explain it to make it a little bit better. But so pretty much what we're shooting for here is to have these gaps not land in the same place. And on the oil ring, you have three parts to it, three gaps, and you don't want those three to line up. So we've got our top rail gap. Let's call it the front of the engine. We'll call that nine o'clock. Then our rail in the center, we've got, let's call that six o'clock. There's the, the gap. Then here's our bottom rail. Let's rotate that. We'll call that three o'clock. So we have the bottom at nine, the, the spacer at six, and the top at three. Then we have our second ring. Um, we don't want the second and first ring to line up. So best way to kind of do that is, is since our bottom oil ring is at nine, but our top is way over here, we're going to put the second ring gap right here. Let's put that at 10 o'clock. And then our top ring gap, um, let's rotate, ro rotate that over to about two, two o'clock. And that way none of our gaps are on the same place, um, which is the whole idea. You don't want, we have a gap here at two, 10 and then going down across the bottom we have three uh six and nine so in that orientation we've got basically all of our gaps in different places on the piston so now we don't have to worry about uh accidentally lining any of them up uh and creating kind of a straight pass through so i'm going to do the other seven pistons um and then we can start assembly all right so all the rings are on except for this last one um, and 
this last one I uh, just kind of wanted to show you um, once again you know if you're going to look at this piston from the front being nine o'clock six o'clock three o'clock we've got the bottom uh, oil scraper ring at nine o'clock we've got the expander in the middle at, at six o'clock and then we've got the top uh, scraper at three o'clock um, we're going to put our top ring our second ring that's labeled top facing up uh, in this groove and remember these are cast rings so they're not going to be real forgiving uh, you can't get too carried away with them uh, so we're going to put this one at about two o'clock this gap right there uh, we're going to put the gap on this ring at about two o'clock so two ten and then going through the sequence three six nine so that's kind of how the rings line up going down uh, looking down on the piston so that's that and uh, next step we're gonna go ahead and put these uh, in and get them ready to go